All right, welcome everyone to the Surveillance Report 154 Q&A. This is where our patrons get to ask us questions. If you want to ask us a question, it's $5 a month or more. And y'all ask really good questions. So not a whole lot this week, but they are good ones. Let's jump right into it. We'll start off with Mr. Camel, one of our regulars. And this week he's asking, what are y'all's favorite desktop environments you've used? Y'all, I like that. Me personally, okay, so I like GNOME or Gnome, sorry. I like Gnome. I like the way it looks. I I think it's really personal opinion for the record. I'll be honest, most of my Linux experience has been cubes. So from the short duration I've spent on other distros, I do like Gnome. It looks really clean and slick. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I like it. Although I will say, uh, I think it's, I think it's XFCE has uh, some interesting features like the ability to connect to a Wi-Fi network and automatically load the VPN, which I'm sure other ones do that too, but in XFC, it's really intuitive. And um, I watch a lot of the Linux experiments, so he's he's really made a good uh, case for KDE. It sounds like it has some really cool power user features, but I haven't used a lot of them personally. So The two I used the most were GNOME and KDE. Cinnamon, I tried it and I just didn't like it right off the bat, so I didn't use it much. But KDE was extremely powerful. Like anything I wanted to do, I could get it done. That was my most complicated. On the other hand, it was the most complicated Linux setup I've ever had. But I was also trying to do like a Windows GPU pass-through configuration. And then that was it was a mess of a Linux computer that I was trying to configure. GNOME is what I would opt for. If I'm like setting up just my own personal machine, nothing complicated, uh, that's what I really like. It's all keyboard-based, which I am a huge fan of. Like it's best keyboard-based, I feel, so... Next question from Benny. Definitely a a touchy subject for sure, but how do you guys think companies such as Session and Mega should go about combating CSAM distribution whilst also maintaining privacy and security for its user base? And so CSAM, for those who don't know, is a more formal term for uh, child sexual abuse material. So definitely tricky subject. Um, It's something that I think, first off, we don't have the answers for because I think the entire community is trying to find a good answer for this. And that's why we're seeing so much uh, legislation about trying to ban end-to-end encryption, which probably isn't the best way of combating things like this because it's going to expose the entire world to big security issues in the process. I do know that in the past, people have accused Mega of not being end-to-end encrypted because Essentially, what was happening is people were uploading piracy content to their mega account, sharing that link. Thousands of people would download pirated content, but if you post the link publicly with the encryption key, then mega itself can go in and scan the file to see what it is and take it off. So I do know in the past that's been one technique, even with services with end-to-end encryption, if the encryption key is actually attached as part of the URL and you're sharing that publicly, there's nothing stopping someone like Mega or another entity from going in and being like, hey, well, this file isn't a legal file. And that was a good piracy demonstration of how they could do that. But aside from that, I don't really have any answers. It's a tricky subject, and I don't feel experienced enough to really comment too much on this issue. I don't know if you have anything else. I totally have the answer. And the answer is we need to backdoor everything. The government's just here to protect us and help us. Sorry, I don't know if my sarcasm's landing. It's late. One little nitpicky thing I do want to point out, I think the public debate using CSAM in regards to end-to-end encryption, I think that's disingenuous personally. I think it's because nobody's going to object to that because if you object, it's so easy to paint you as like, oh, so you want to enable this. You're a monster. You hate children. So it's it's just like a, it's not a straw man. Well, it kind of is, I guess. It's just, yeah, it's disingenuous in my opinion. But that said, I do believe it is a serious problem and obviously- we're not monsters. We're not in favor of, of spreading that stuff. But I think you're kind of right, actually. Like, we don't really have an answer. It's easier to sit here and say what we shouldn't do. Like, we shouldn't backdoor encryption. We shouldn't spy on everybody just without cause. But at the same time, like, yeah, it's hard to say It's hard to say what should be done. You know, we shouldn't scan every single message because that can very quickly be abused. And I think what frustrates me about this issue is that there actually are technologies that deal with this that do exist. There are algorithms that can go in and scan photos and be able to try to recognize what's going on in photos. I know that Apple tries to implement this a lot lot of this locally and uh, there are technologies that exist. In fact, if you use Google Drive, if you use Apple Photos, anything that syncs to these cloud providers, they have some kind of auto scanning that does this kind of stuff. I think that if they could take this technology and make it more privacy respecting and make it run locally on people's devices without the need for the cloud, I'm not inherently against something like that as long as it was implemented in a way that respected users and made sure that there was still 
a very clear distinction behind when this happened. Users were aware of when it was happening and there was no kind of personal data distributed from their device, which I haven't seen yet for the record. I haven't seen a company that actually laid out a way that they would implement this kind of technology in a privacy respecting way. I think the issue is, at least from my perspective, I think the issue is that it becomes a slippery slope because everyone, governments, you give them an inch and they'll take a mile, you know, and it's that's that's the issue. I think that's why Apple canceled, at least on paper, putting aside the tinfoil hats and conspiracy theories for now on paper. That's why Apple abandoned this initiative is because they couldn't find a way to do it where it doesn't become like, well, let's also use this to like scan for pictures of this terrorist. And then from there it becomes like, well, let's also use it to scan for pictures of this violent criminal. And then in foreign countries it becomes, let's also use this to scan for, you know, dissident, like not, not to get too far off topic, but the, the proton mail story with the French activist, when that story first broke, um, for those of you who are brand new and don't know what we're talking about real quick, proton mail was forced via a court order to monitor a particular inbox until somebody signed in and then turn over the IP address. They were monitoring in real time. It was a court order and the person didn't use a VPN. So they were able to get their IP address and the authorities were able to find them. When that story broke, I've heard people argue, uh, and I don't know how legitimate it is for the record because I haven't seen anybody cite a source, but I've heard people argue over like some people were saying like, it was an activist, but then other people were saying like, yeah, but also they were doing illegal activity. Like they were, At very least, they were squatting in the building that they weren't supposed to be in and stuff like that. So, you know, and then it becomes that it's, you know, and I really don't want to go too off the rails philosophically here, but, you know, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Like there's there's plenty of terrorists that don't think they're the bad guys. And it's 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 just, yeah, it becomes a slippery slope. The technology exists, but how can we ensure how can we safeguard it in such a way where it doesn't get abused? That's fair. I think what that speaks to then for me is, you know, uh, that this is less of a you know, if the technology does exist, assuming it does, um, then it's less of a technology issue and more of a people issue. This kind of reminds me of social media platforms right now. We ha- probably have all the technology we need to have healthy social media platforms and have things coexist and live happily. But at the end of the day, it's people that are using social media platforms and people who are behind everything and there's humans involved. And that's a tough thing to grapple with. So... That's, that's what I would say. I think that this, if the technology does exist and that's the assumption we're going under, then this is a huge issue, a human issue of trying to navigate uh, humans. I agree 100%. That's how I feel about most technologies. Like I caught a, sorry, I'm feeling talkative. I, I caught a lot of flack when I said that like facial recognition in schools, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I'm opposed to the fact that it's always some third party company who never says what the algorithm is using, who never says how long the data is stored or, you know, any of that stuff, like the technology itself isn't necessarily bad. It's all the other peripherals about it that like, what's it going to be used for? What are they going to do with the data? How long is it going to be stored? All that kind of stuff. And that's really the issue with a lot of things in life, in my opinion, is not the system itself. Cause do I want to be a political? I'll, I'll be this political. Every economic system looks fantastic on paper. It's once you get the people involved in practice that things fall apart. And yeah, I think technology is the same way. A lot of them look great on paper, but anyways, I'm going in circles. Like I said, it was a short week, so our last question comes from David Johnson. Are you aware of any FOSS software that can automatically pair local encryption to the relatively inexpensive but non-private cloud storage options from big tech, such as Google Drive, iCloud, et cetera, to use as a private backup? There's a little bit more to the question, but this, at least on an initial read, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think you're just describing Cryptomator. That was kind of my thought when I read this, is it, it sounds like Cryptomator. It's, um, for those of you who haven't heard of it, I think it is a one-time $5 fee for a license, but uh, so I guess in that sense, it's not technically FOSS. Anyone can view the source and they just set up an encrypted vault in your Google Drive or iCloud or Dropbox or whatever, and you throw the files in there and it syncs it across all your devices and then it decrypts it locally on your device. That's a really popular option for a lot of people. I would say start there. And if I'm misunderstanding the question, let me know because that was the first thing that came to mind when I was reading your question how I interpreted the question too. Because what David's describing is essentially setting up like a Vercrypt encrypted container and uploading that to Google Drive. But Cryptomator is just that, but much cleaner and much better done and a lot less risk of errors and issues. So yeah, I would look into that. So that's all we got this week. Like I said, short week, but really good questions, really thoughtful questions. And if you want to ask the next thoughtful and potentially controversial question, go ahead and visit our Patreon and your question might be featured on our next episode thing. 
Video. Video. That's the word I was looking for. It was a long Q &A. day. Q and A. So thank you guys for watching. What's up? Q and A. Q and A. <laughs> yeah, sure. That thing. The post is already live on Patreon. So thank you guys for watching. And we will see you this weekend with more privacy and security news.